Hello, and welcome to Shimadzu's Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography. This is session 9, where we'll be looking at GC method development. My name is Andrew Clissold, I'm the GC Business Manager here at Shimadzu, and I'll be your presenter for this session. This is the ninth session in our Theory and Key Principles series. If you missed any of the previous sessions, I recommend you watch these first and then sign up the next available slot for this session. All previous episodes are available on demand and can be accessed from our website. We hope that you'll continue to join us over the coming weeks where we'll be looking at GC mass spectrometry in more detail. In this session, we will look at how to approach method development and some of the key parameters to be aware of. Method development is a bit like maintenance and troubleshooting, in that it is not something that can easily be taught. Experience is the best teacher, and it can take years of practice and a lot of mistakes to get truly good. So whilst the following instructions should be helpful, you really need to roll up your sleeves and practice. Here we've put together a few tips and tricks, and things to think about, to help put you on the right path. You may find this session a bit nostalgic, as we'll be looking back at the topics we've covered over the past eight sessions. So in some ways, this session will act as a summary for the key points you've learnt so far. So let's start by looking at what we need to consider when beginning to develop a GC method. The first question to answer is whether GC is the best technique for the analysis, or if it's even viable in the first place. Remember that GC is only suitable for relatively non-polar analytes with low molecular weight. In fact, GC analysis is only really suitable for around 10 to 20% of known organic compounds. HPLC might be a better technique for the application, and would be best to refer to the literature to see what other analysts have used. The biggest question, which people often find is the hardest to answer, is what are my analytical goals? If you can't answer this, you can't know where to begin. Are the analytical goals qualitative or quantitative? If they're qualitative, do you need to identify unknowns in your sample? If they're quantitative, what concentration ranges do you need to analyse? What would be the highest and lowest concentrations you'd expect to find? It might be that you're simply looking to improve an existing method. If so, what are the criteria? Are you looking to improve sensitivity, separation, runtime? or change the carrier gas. You need to know what the goal is for your improvements so you can focus your attention on these. In summary, make sure you can answer these questions before you begin. The answers will guide you through the rest of the process and ensure your goals are achieved. The second area to consider is the samples themselves. Are the samples gaseous, liquid or solid? This will determine how we can introduce the analytes into the GC column. What else is in the sample other than the target analytes? Do we have any semi or even non-volatile components in the mix that we might need to account for? Is the sample matrix dirty enough that we'll need to look at some type of sample cleanup? And what about the target analytes themselves? Are we looking at a handful of components, or are we dealing with an extremely complex mixture that may require advanced separation techniques? Are the analytes polar or non-polar? This will impact our column choice. Are there any acidic or basic components, like carboxylic acids or amines, that might require modification before they can be analysed by GC. What if we're working with a gas mixture? If so, which detector would be suitable for all the components? Are there any halogenated components or compounds with nitrogen, sulphur or phosphorus that we could use in a selective detector? 
and are there any components thermally labile or particularly active that might need pretreatment or special consideration? As you can see, sample content throws a number of questions and you must consider all of these carefully. A suitable method can only be developed if we're using the right instrument with the right configuration. That leads us on to thinking about derivatization and sample preparation. If you feel that your sample contains components that are not suitable for GC, modifying them before injection may provide better options for method development. Derivatization is a technique that chemically changes a component's functional group or groups to form a derivative of the original compound. There are a number of reasons why we might do this. Making the compound less active to increase stability, making compounds more volatile to increase sensitivity. Changing the compound's functional group could aid separation and improve solubility in certain solvents. It could also be used to increase detection with certain selective detectors. There are different types of derivatizations for different functional groups, including hydroxyl, carboxyl and amino. These polar groups can be converted into much less polar methyl, trimethylsilyl or trifluoacetyl derivatives. This means components that would not be particularly suitable for GC analysis can be chemically altered to become less polar and or more volatile. Compounds that are likely to stick to active sites in the GC can be made less active to improve robustness and peak shape. Ultimately, derivatization can significantly improve GC methods and make previously difficult samples easy to work with. It also, however, adds more time, labor, and opportunity for error. Think carefully and weigh up the pros and cons of taking this approach. Having assessed the sample, we should now consider the means of introduction. What, if any sampler, should we use to place our analytes in the GC column? Remember that there are a number of ways to introduce a sample into the GC system. As well as liquid injection, we can use Headspace or SPME to help with difficult matrices in both liquid and solid samples. Gas sampling valves offer excellent reproducibility for gas mixtures and pyrolysis is ideal for high boiling components and polymers. Thermal desorption is a highly flexible technique with a wide range of applications. As a reminder, here's a table outlining which sample techniques are generally appropriate for which use of gas, liquid and solid samples. But remember that many of these techniques have varying properties within the instrument itself. Pyrolysis and thermal desorption come in different versions and have multiple modes of operation. So if you're looking for new equipment, make sure you speak to a technical specialist about the application so you can make the right choice. A final consideration is maintenance. Cleaner introduction techniques such as Headspace or SPEMI put considerably less strain on the GC and reduce the frequency that maintenance is required. For liquid injection, think about the solvent your sample will be dissolved in. It needs to be amenable to GC analysis, so ideally not water, needs to fully dissolve your sample, and needs to have a retention time that is different to the compounds of interest. Work out how much you're going to inject. You need to inject enough for good sensitivity of your analytes, but injecting too much will cause backflash Use a solvent expansion calculator, as shown here, to work out your maximum volume that you can inject. And always select a syringe size that is suitable for the injection volume. Your injection volume should be in the 10 to 90% range of your syringe capacity. So you can feasibly inject between 1 and 9 microliters, say, on a 10 microliter syringe. Outside of this range, the reproducibility will be poor. Finally, think about what solvent, or ideally solvents, you'll rinse a syringe with before and after each injection. 
it should be the same solvent you use for the sample preparation, but it's often helpful to use a second solvent with different polarity to help keep the bowel from getting contaminated. Injection speed will have an impact, but most systems these days have a default injection speed, which is optimised for that particular piece of hardware. For headspace sampling, the considerations are different. For this, let's assume we're working with an aqueous sample. The key parameters here are incubation temperature and equilibration time. With the matrix including water, the temperature needs to be below the boiling point, so somewhere between 50 and 80 degrees is likely to work best. Try using 10 degree increments to see which gives you the best sensitivity if you're looking for trace amounts. It's important that the equilibration time is sufficient for the sample to reach equilibrium, even if you're not looking for low-level concentrations. Not being at equilibrium will impact the reproducibility between injections. Experiment with different times as part of your development. Other parameters that would impact the results are the sample amount or volume, and the vial size used. The more liquid and less headspace, the greater headspace concentration will be. But ensure the vial is not overfilled, as the needle should not contact the liquid at any time. Finally, for headspace, think about whether or not to add salt to your sample. This has been shown to improve sensitivity, but adds an extra step to sample preparation. Now we should consider carrier gas and the various options available. If you're trying to decide which gas to select, it's worth remembering that helium has been the go-to for a long time. But with increasing prices and supply issues, people are more seriously considering alternatives. If you'd like to find out more, check out our Helium Save It or Swap It series on our website after this webinar. As you remember from session one, each gas has different properties, so it's important to use the correct optimal linear velocity for the carrier gas you're using. The curves also vary slightly with different com dimensions, so it's worth taking this into account too. As a starting point, try 15 centimeters per second for nitrogen, 35 for helium, and 50 when using hydrogen. You'll find that almost all GC systems have different carrier gas control modes available. These are usually constant pressure, constant flow, and constant average linear velocity. Choosing which one you use is important if your oven temperature will change during the analysis. That's because the viscosity of a gas and its volume increases as temperature increases. So applying a constant pressure results in the gas speed and flow decreasing over time. Applying a constant flow results in the gas pressure and velocity increasing over time. So, where available, you should use a constant average linear velocity, as this ensures you maintain the optimal separating efficiency across the entire analysis. So, once you've decided which gas you're going to use, we can now begin to look at the inlet parameters. For a liquid injection in a split-splitless inlet, we must firstly determine whether we're going to use split or splitless mode. To begin with, I'd recommend using a split injection so that you can focus on separating the peaks on the column. If more sensitivity is required, this can be changed later on. Try to use a split ratio between 20 to 50 to 1 to begin with and adjust your standard concentration to ensure you're sitting well within the detector's dynamic range. Since you've already chosen your linear velocity for the carrier gas, only two further parameters remain, inlet temperature and purge flow. Inlet temperature will be based on the volatility of your analytes. A good starting point for most applications is 250 degrees. If your analytes are in the semi-volatile range, consider increasing the temperature to 300. Use vendor application note to assist you with selecting the most suitable temperature. 
the purge flow is more simple. It's usually 3 mils a minute for GC and 6 for GCMS. This may vary between vendors, so check the recommended settings if you're not using a Shimadzu GC. For splitless analysis, you'll also need to have a sampling time, which should be the time taken to completely flush the liner through one and a half to two times. After this, the split vent should be opened again to ensure a good sweep of the liner. Remember that most systems these days have a gas saver mode to help reduce carrier gas consumption. This can be turned on after one or two minutes from injection or one or two minutes after the split sampling time. Generally, gas saver mode is usually set at a split ratio of 10 to 1. For a PTV or OCI inlet, these have a temperature program associated with them. For a PTV, the idea is to transfer the analytes rapidly onto the column, so a high temperature ramp is appropriate. For an OCI, the temperature is usually programmed to track the oven temperature, sometimes with a slight positive or negative offset. If you have access to an OCI, these are actually great for method development, as you effectively remove the inlet parameters from your initial development. This makes troubleshooting far easier, as any problems are most likely column related. And when you transfer back to a split split inlet, you'll be able to check for any impact on the chromatography and take appropriate action. The final thing to consider with your inlet is the liner. As we discussed last time, there are a huge number of liner choices available, varying in geometry, packing and coating. If you're unsure where to start, speak to your GC vendor or preferred consumable supplier and they'll be able to make suggestions. The next step in the GC flow path is the column. Selecting your column can be one of the trickiest things to do. Unlike the inlet, you can't simply change the column at the press of a button. A typical column can cost somewhere between three and six hundred pounds, so it's important to select the correct column first time. There are two main decisions to make. What dimension and what stationary phase. In terms of dimensions, the 30 meter 0 0.25, 0 0.25 column is the most common and acts as a good all rounder. If your method is looking at very volatiles, consider a thicker film. And if you're looking at semi-volatiles, consider a thinner one. If you're looking to speed up an existing method, try reducing the length and internal diameter of the column. Provided the phase ratio, that's the ratio between the diameter and the film thickness, is the same, the separation of components should be largely unaffected. Narrower columns have a much greater resolving power than wider ones, so you can reduce the length and runtime while still maintaining good peak separation. Again, use literature to help you find a suitable column for your application, or speak to a column manufacturer for suggestions. For column phase, remember that like dissolves like. If your target analytes are nonpolar, be sure to select a nonpolar column for the analysis. Many vendors have unique columns for specific compounds, such as PAHs and FAMES. Now this isn't to say that you have to have that column for that application. These are often standard columns that have been slightly tweaked for specific applications. Most applications can be achieved with a regular column, provided you follow the rules we've suggested. As before, if you're not sure, use application notes for inspiration or talk to a column manufacturer. And if you've got no idea what's in your sample, try a 5% 30 meter 2525. This is the true jack of all trades column and there's a good chance it'll do the job. Once you've selected a suitable column, we can now finally start to look at oven temperatures. This is what most people think of when discussing method development, as it has a significant effect on peak separation. Now, once again, and I'm going to keep saying this, look for application notes from GC and column manufacturers. 
And don't just look at your own GC vendor's application notes. Look at other vendors too. From a development point of view, it shouldn't make a huge difference. If you're genuinely unsure where to begin, start low and use a slow oven ramp. Try starting from 35 degrees and heat at 10 degrees per minute all the way up to 300, or around 20 degrees below the maximum programmable temperature for the column. In this example, you can see that these parameters result in a good separation of all peaks. You may wish to leave the development here, or make further changes to optimise the method. The initial area in blue is over-separated, and could be changed to reduce the overall runtime. So let's try increasing the start temperature to 50 degrees and putting an initial oven ramp of 25 degrees per minute. And here's what it looks like. We've nicely condensed the first four peaks to speed up the method. The change has had some negative effects as well though, and we now have closely eluting peaks in the blue region. So let's try slowing this ramp down to 5 degrees per minute from the beginning of the blue region. If this doesn't work, we could try holding the temperature isothermally during this time range. So reducing the ramp rate was enough to fully separate these peaks. Great. The final section of peaks, now in blue, aren't of any analytical interest, so there's no need to separate them nicely. We can ramp the oven up to drive those off the column quickly further reducing the runtime. Having heated the final ramp rate to force the components off the column as quickly as possible reduces the total runtime by approximately 30%. The trick here is the order in which the changes are made. Notice that we worked across the chromatogram systematically from left to right, improving the method as we went. A change to the oven program at 10 minutes will affect all peaks after that time. Hence, by working from left to right, we do not undo improvements we have made with subsequent changes. Note that we also reran the sample after each change to observe the result before making a second. Before we move on, here's a few final thoughts to consider when designing an oven program. Be careful not to exceed the maximum ramp rate. If you ask the oven to heat up faster than it physically can, the method will not be consistent. If your column isn't effectively separating the most volatile components, drop the temperature and increase the initial hold time. Some polar columns have a minimum temperature, and separation peak shape actually gets worse if you start below this threshold. And for those of you running splitless analysis, Ensure your initial oven temperature is held for at least the sampling time. If you've made it this far, well done, the hard work is over. We should take a few moments to discuss detector choice. This is far less complex than the previous sections, so don't worry. Selecting a detector is usually pretty straightforward. There's a finite choice, and you're going to be guided largely by sensitivity. Remember to also consider dynamic range. That's the smallest and largest concentration the detector can see. You'll need one that can encompass all your samples. You may also want to think about maintenance. Some detectors, like an FID or a TCD, require very little maintenance, while others, like SCD and MS, require more frequent cleaning. Think about whether you want a universal or selective detector. If you're looking to perform a purity test on organic components, an FID might work best. But if you're looking to check impurities in gases, a TCD or BID would be better. If you're looking for specific compound types, such as sulfur, a selective detector would be excellent. You then only have to choose between FPD and SCD. So, as I said, which detector you use is one of the easiest questions to answer. As some general advice, when setting up your detector, always follow the manufacturer's instructions, especially regarding temperatures and flow rates. For some detectors, there'll be additional parameters too, so ensure you read the manual. In an ideal world, 
your detected temperature should be at least as high as the final oven temperature to prevent any cold spots in the system. You now have all the basic information required to develop a GC method. As a few final thoughts, here is some general advice if you're starting out for the first time. You can save yourself a lot of time by not trying to reinvent the wheel. There is a huge amount of data that exists on the internet to help you. Even experienced analysts tend to start with Google as a first port of call when developing new methods. And nine times out of 10, you'll be greeted with a wealth of information from peer reviewed literature to GC or column vendor application notes and tools. Some websites now even have tools which can model chromatograms based on previous application data. Simply input the target analytes and it'll suggest appropriate columns and method parameters. Just bear in mind these are theoretical projections, so may still require some tweaking. It's not cheating to get a running start, but once you've got a good start, stop and think. Make a plan. List the parameters you're going to change, the range of those changes, and which parameters you'll do first. When planning, follow the flow path you're going to take. Based on the questions you've answered about the sample and the analytes of interest, you should already have a pretty good idea of which detector you'll need and which column is going to be most suitable. And from doing some research in literature, you should also have an idea of which sample introduction technique and inlet to use. If you're unsure about any of these choices, go back to one of the previous sessions to explore in more detail. Also bear in mind the various chemicals you'll need to develop your method. A reference standard containing all the analytes of interest is an excellent start. A mid-range standard is good for initial method development, and a high and low are useful to check peak dynamic range. We'd also recommend spiking these standards into a matrix, similar to what real samples would look like. This allows you to simulate real world samples as closely as possible. So, that concludes our method development lecture. Let's summarize the key points. For the detector, select one capable of observing all your analytes and consider the maintenance requirements. For the column, select one that gives you good separation based on previous literature. Thick film, longer columns give better separation and narrower columns give better peak shape. For the inlet, a split injection works for 95% of applications. Consider splitless for sensitivity and OCI PTV for special applications. For carrier gas, helium is a solid choice. Hydrogen can also be utilized for faster methods and lower running costs. For the oven program, work from left to right. Make one change at a time and check the column temperature ranges. For the sampler, consider the sample phase, solid, liquid, or gas, and remember that headspace can be used to reduce GC maintenance. If you'd like to receive the latest news from Shimadzu, including information on webinars, workshops, and events, please join our newsletter by going to our website. So, that concludes our Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography. If you've made it this far, congratulations. We started this series to help the scientific community continue their learning through the COVID-19 crisis. And while the crisis has impacted all our lives, we hope this series has brought some positivity and stability in these uncertain times. All the content from this series is available for you to access on demand from our website in case you want to revisit any topics. And whilst we might have concluded the GC series, Nina Smith will be here at the start of September to present the Theory and Key Principles series on gas chromatography mass spectrometry. This five session series will introduce you to GCMS and will cover single and triple quad systems, as well as GCMS operation, maintenance and method development. Please register for the first few sessions on our website. We look forward to seeing you in September.
If you'd like to get in contact with us, the contact details for the UK attendees are now on screen. For those joining outside the UK, you can find contact details for your local Shimadzu office by visiting Shimadzu's global analytical website. All that's left for me to say is a huge thank you for joining us over the past four months. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Excellence in science, Shimazu.